Good morning. Welcome back. I'm going to get right into this. We've got a lot of uh, new exciting things to get motivated. And we're going to move conceptually at a slow rate this morning. And then that'll set up a bunch of new types of models that you'll learn in the next several lectures through this week and the next week. Uh, but we need to get all of our philosophy in place first. And that's the first thing I want to do today. So put statistics out of your mind for a second. And um, instead, imagine you've got five buckets <laughs> uh, positioned equidistant from you, from your feet. And then in a pile at your feet, there are a bunch of pretty little pebbles, uh, each of which has been painted with a number. And there are a 100 of these pebbles. And I show only like a dozen here on the screen because I got tired of drawing pebbles. Uh, but each of them is numbered individually. They're, they're unique pebbles, right? Each has an identity. Uh, but to us, they're just all going to be exchangeable pebbles because we're just interested in uh, what happens when we toss these pebbles one at a time into buckets at random. So I want you to imagine you could toss these pebbles one at a time in such a way that each pebble has an equal chance of landing in any of the five buckets. Yeah. Uh, if you miss a bucket, you go pick it up and you throw again. <laughs> Something like that. Eventually, all the pebbles, all 100, end up in the buckets, distributed somehow, and then you count them. And what you get is a distribution of counts of pebbles in the buckets. And my question to you is, what are these distributions like? There's some family <coughs> of them. Uh, what types of distributions are really common? what types of distributions are really rare. And we can approach this um, intuitively. Maybe I can motivate it for you. We think about extreme distributions first. So there's only uh, one way that you can get all the pebbles in bucket one, and that's to have all the pebbles in bucket one. All right, so uh, there's no other arrangement of individual pebbles which will give you this. Um, likewise, for the other extreme, you can get all 100 pebbles in bucket five or any of the other buckets. So there are five unique distributions which have all the pebbles in any particular bucket. Probably you won't ever see that distribution, but it's possible, right? Um, there are a bunch of distributions which can happen a bunch of different ways, but they will look the same, but the individual pebble numbers will be exchanged across buckets. So consider this distribution here where we have 5, 22, 12, 37, 24 pebbles arranged in the buckets. I hope that sums to 100. Someone check. If it doesn't, eh, let's not talk about it. It's supposed to sum to 100. And um, uh, we could take a pebble from bucket 2 and exchange it with a pebble from bucket 3 without changing the distribution. But it's a different distribution. And it would arise through a different order of tosses. Right. And then I ask you, how many ways could you realize this distribution? Well, that's what we're going to solve today. And what I assert is this is the principle of Bayesian inference is this very problem, that some distributions can arise in exceedingly very many more ways than other distributions. And those are the things, those are the distributions that Bayesian inference gives us. And this is a principle called maximum entropy that I want to explain to you. Um, and it's a principle bigger than Bayesian inference that justifies Bayesian inference, and it's going to help us do modeling going forward. So let's put aside uh, arithmetic for a second. Um, I don't really like arithmetic. I'm not very good at it, but I like algebra, right? It's more fun. <laughs> so I always like if there's, a, if there's an actual written digit, I always like to replace it with an X, right? It makes me happier. <laughs> so let's replace all those actual integers with Ns. We have N1, 2, 3, 4, 5, which are the bucket counts. And let's talk about the properties of these counts and what can happen. Um, at some point in your education, you learned and then uh, healthily forgot <laughs> the fact that there's a formula for the number of different arrangements of the pebbles that will give you these same counts. It comes from combinatorics. You probably learned it in secondary school and then never used it, right? Um, and here it is. It's called the multiplicity. Uh, this is just from combinatorics, the number of unique ways to realize this distribution n1, n2, n3, n4, n5 is capital N factorial, which is the number of pebbles, in this case 100, divided by the product of the factorials of each. Uh, and again, at some point in secondary school you learned this, right? And then you were like, well, I'm never going to use this, this is crazy. Well, now you get to use it. I'll tell you why it's important. It's the foundation of statistical inference. Uh, so. 
give you some intuition. This is a very powerful result because this thing uh, gets big really fast when the ends get equal. And I want to give you a motivation for that. Uh, so let's think about an extreme distribution again. But now let's consider only 10 tuples because if it was 100, well, the numbers, will, as you'll see, they would, they would take up the whole slide. So let's do 10. The lesson will be fine with 10. With 100, it's even more extreme. So there's only one way to get all the pebbles in bucket three, right? Intuition delivers that for you? Yeah. Now, the formula on the previous slide will also deliver that for you. Uh, but there's only one way to do this, uh, to make that happen. Um, how many ways do you think there are? We're going to take one pebble from bucket three now. Uh, and we're going to move it to bucket two, and we're going to take one pebble from bucket three and move it to bucket four so that we've got one pebble in bucket two, eight in bucket three, and one in bucket four. How many different arrangements of individual pebbles do you think can make that distribution? <laughs> Somebody's seen this lecture before, but just an idea of order of magnitude. And the answer is there are 90 ways to do this. Yeah. But they've also uploaded the slides, so some, <laughs> you can check and see. Uh, it's really, really bigger. <laughs> it's like a massively number of ways. So this is just going to accelerate. We're going to keep playing this game. Maybe you don't find it exciting. Uh, but people have really bad intuitions about combinatorics. And this is, I'm, I'm trying to justify why statistics works here. <laughs> so, um, this is the justification, I think, about why statistics works, because these numbers go up so fast. Uh, we're going to, again, take two pebbles from the middle bucket and move them out to the sides. Now we've got two pebbles in bucket two and four and six in bucket three. How many now? Uh, now it's over a thousand. So basically we're getting an order of magnitude increase every time we distribute a couple of pebbles out. Many, many more arrangements to make this stuff work. Uh, and indulge me, I like this. This is fun. <laughs> we're gonna keep going. Uh, now we distribute a couple more and we put them on the extremes. So we get one, two, four, two, one are the counts. How many ways to get, how many unique arrangements of pebbles can produce this distribution? And the answer is 37,800 different ways uh, to do it. And there's nothing special about that number except that it's really big. Yeah, and it's, it's hugely bigger than the previous one. Every one of these is massively bigger, an order of magnitude, in fact, bigger than the previous one before it. Uh, so we've got one more. We can make this uh, uh, flatter yet. So now here in the, in the uh, bottom middle of this slide, I show you a distribution where there are two pebbles in each bucket. It's the flattest, most distributed. We can possibly get the pebbles. And we finally reach a maximum. Uh, the number of ways you can realize this distribution is uh, 113,400 different ways. And there is no other arrangement of the pebbles which has more ways to be realized than this. And this is a general principle of statistical inference, is that distributions which are flat can be realized in many, many more unique ways. And this is why we bet on them. They have high entropy. And you may remember from, was it last week, the week before, we talked about when you're calculating KL divergence or distances, flat distributions are closer to other distributions. Somehow, somehow magically, right? Remember that the Earth was closer to Mars than Mars was to Earth? Remember this story? This is another property of these things. Is these flat distributions can be realized in a huge number of ways. They're less surprised when the distribution turns out to be different. and Their, their divergence is, is smaller uh, to other distributions. And these things become uh, then really good foundations for statistical inference uh, because they distribute the possibilities as widely as possible. Um, so let me show you what happens here is that this is a unique way to actually, in fact, derive the information entropy formula. It's nothing more than the multiplicity. So uh, there's a box in uh, chapter 10 where I show you the mathematics of this if you're interested. Uh, but here's the pure intuitive version. So uh, we had this W thing before, which is the multiplicity, the number of ways to get these ends. Um, let's imagine we take the log of that multiplicity and then divide it by the number of pebbles. So this is like a per pebble magnitude of ways, right? So we've normalized it across the number of pebbles. And uh, it turns out that is approximately, this is a very good approximation. There's this approximation I, I'm sure some of you know called Sterling's approximation for logarithms. Um, uh, gives you this, 
uh, uh, minus the sum over all the, uh, all the buckets uh, ni over n uh, times the log of ni over n. And this should look eerily familiar. It is the information entropy formula. And this is one way to derive it. And you're like, OK, that's very nice, Richard. What are you getting at? Information entropy is just uh, this thing. It's just the logarithm of the number of ways to realize a distribution. That's what information entropy is. And it's maximized when the distribution is flat. And flatter distributions have higher entropy. And that's all it is. There's nothing magical about it. It's just counting. And I want to use this to draw this all the way back to the beginning of the course and then give us a way to go forward to think about using many different kinds of outcome distributions in our models. But we want them to have this property that they are the distribution that is as flattest possible consistent with the constraints that we put in given what we know scientifically about the data before we see it. Uh, so this perspective on statistical inference it's due to a large number of people, um, but it's most centrally associated with one man, uh, the American physicist uh, Edwin Jaynes, and uh, seen here in his uh, Navy uh, uniform <laughs> when he was a young man. And uh, so Jaynes published a lot on the maximum entropy principle, uh, which is connected very closely to Bayesian inference. Uh, the principle is really just that the distribution with the largest entropy is the distribution most consistent with our stated assumptions. And if you choose any other distribution to characterize your state of knowledge, uh, you will be implicitly adding other information in there. That you, and you don't know what it is, but you've smuggled some unknown bits of information into your distribution. And so the argument was, well, if you lay out all the constraints, the things you think you know before the data arrive, and then you solve for the distribution that's as flat as possible under those constraints, you're doing the best you possibly can. You're honestly characterizing your ignorance. Uh, and that's the maximum entropy principle. Um, and it just comes from the fact, what we saw with the pebbles, uh, those are the distributions that can arise the largest number of ways. So there are lots of conceptual things I think are nice for this. Um, and I'll give you examples as we go forward. For parameters, this gives us a way to understand the meaning of a prior. What's, what are the constraints that make a prior uh, uh, re legitimate? Right? What is the information content of a, of a prior distribution? And uh, for observations as well, it gives us a way to understand the likelihood uh, on top. So when, when I introduced Gaussian distributions weeks ago, um, I think it was even before Christmas, wasn't it? Uh, I, I gave you this argument that there's a maximum entropy interpretation of the Gaussian. If all you know about a measure is that it has finite variance, you should choose a Gaussian to characterize it. Well, I don't know if you should or not, but if you but the distribution consistent with that information that contains no other information is the Gaussian. The Gaussian is just the flattest distribution possible uh, for a measure on the whole real number line that has finite variance. There is no other distribution with the same variance that is flatter. I know it seems weird. <laughs> if you look at chapter 10, I've got a proof of this. There's a little box with some integrals. You'll love it. <laughs> right? And uh, um, it turns out that Bayesian updating, what we've been doing in this course, is a special case of this principle. Uh, so you can start with um, the constraints on the, on the variables. That is, if they're, they have to be positive or if they're bounded to some maximum, any kind of constraint you like. You can input the data as constraints because the data, they put these direct delta functions on values. Those, those of you who know, love direct delta functions, if you don't, don't worry about it. It's just you put a spike. You put a probability spike on a value. You put, feed all that in, and you get the posterior distribution out by solving the maximum entropy problem. Uh, so Bayesian updating is just a special case of this larger inference framework. And I'm not saying that then we're going to do it this way. It's just that you want to understand that what you're doing when you, when you solve for the posterior distribution is you're getting the distribution that is as flat as possible and consistent with the data. That's what the posterior distribution that Bayesian inference gives you is. It's the flattest distribution possible, consistent with the constraints and the data. No other distribution could be flatter and still be consistent with that information that you put into it. So it's the highest entropy answer. And why is that good? Doesn't entropy sound bad? No, it's exactly the opposite, because that means your distance to the truth is smaller. Right? That's the whole bet that you get for maximizing entropy. OK, this is, this is the church of entropy this morning. <laughs> uh, one way to think about this, though, is that this is deflationary. There's nothing magic about statistics. It's saying, well, junk that can happen lots of ways, we're going to bet on that. Right? So you 
folks threw a bunch of pebbles into some buckets and now I got to bet on a distribution, I'm going to bet it's pretty even. Why? Because no matter what happens, an even distribution is bound to arise. And that's all that statistical inference is doing. We don't know what's going to happen. We put in a tiny sliver of scientific information into our model. And then what's left? We bet on entropy. Everything else is just betting on entropy. Isn't it majestic? <laughs> right? There's no access to truth here. There's nothing except betting on stuff that can happen in lots of ways. And that's all it is. Uh, but that's amazing. <laughs> it, it works incredibly well, even though it sounds colossally stupid. Right? <laughs> uh, but that's really all it is. So um, here's, here's my summary slide of what I just tried to say. Uh, but let, it'll, I want to use this to motivate forward a bit to other distributions. It's probably intuitive to you, it might not be, that uh, if we were going to maximize this function by choosing the values inside the vector p, this is information entropy, um, that if all the p's are equal, it would have highest value. If that's not intuitive to you, play around with it on your R command line, and you'll see. <laughs> uh, you can't do any better than that. If you make them equal, they're highest. And this is why I gave you that homework problem with the burbs. That was not a typo, by the way. Uh, the burbs. There was one island where the burbs were equally frequent, and that had the highest entropy. Yeah, it's because that's what that's how you maximize entropy. Is you make things equally likely, that minimizes your surprise. Yeah. Um, but sometimes there are constraints which prevent us from making all the p's equal. And then what happens? Well, then we get the flattest thing possible, consistent with those constraints. What might those constraints be? They could be constraints like the variance is known, or the mean, or the, or the average logarithm, or any number of things. And depending upon the constraints you input, you get a different distribution, and the maxim, there will be some other distribution that maximizes entropy. So this is what we did, actually, uh, way back in the beginning of the course. I think this was week one, right, where I took you through the Garden of Forking Pass, and just imagine we drew some marbles, and then we imagine all the alternative draws you could get from the bag, and we're trying to say, how likely is it the thing we got? And we just counted up all the different paths through the garden. This is entropy maximization. And the probability distribution you get from this exercise is a maximum entropy distribution. So they're actually pretty easy to derive in principle. It's tedious to do the counting. Uh, there are compressed mathematical ways to do it. But if all you do is count up all the ways that stuff can happen and use that as your probability distribution, then you're using a maximum entropy distribution. So there's nothing magical about it. And all of the familiar probability distributions of applied statistics are maximum entropy under some set of constraints. Now you can use them in the wrong circumstances, right, where the constraints don't match, but under some set of constraints they are maximum entropy distributions. So I'll give you an idea, um, the uniform is the one I asserted. If the only constraint is there's some real value within an interval, the maximum, uh, the so-called max int, maximum entropy distribution, is a uniform. That's like your burb homework, right? Um, if instead we have some real value and it has finite variance, then the maxent distribution is Gaussian. There's no flatter distribution that could give you that. Again, in chapter 10, there's this whole section where I try to motivate this for you and draw some pictures of alternative distributions with the same variance but aren't Gaussian. So you try to get some idea about what's going on. Uh, if you have binary outcomes, you're just counting coin tosses, and there's a fixed probability of each of the outcomes across trials, then the max int distribution is binomial, which is what we're going to play with today more. But that's also the globe tossing distribution that we had originally, or the marble drawing distribution that we had. It's max int. There's no other distribution which is flatter uh, than the binomial. And why? Because the binomial is the distribution that just counts the paths. And any other distribution you use is smuggling some other kind of constraint in there. And maybe that constraint is legitimate, but we've got to figure out what it is. Yeah. Um, and then uh, we've, I've been using these exponential distributions all course for scale parameters like standard deviations, but I've mainly brushed aside questions about why. Well, now I'm ready to reveal why I like them. Uh, they have Exponential distributions have this nice property that they have a very clear maximum entropy constraint. If all you're going to say about a parameter is that it's non-negative real and has some mean value, then the exponential contains only that information. So it's very clear what it means. You can set the sort of average magnitude of that scale parameter as a prior and then use the exponential. It's nice. That doesn't mean you have to use an exponential, but it has a very clear interpretation. It has some nice properties. Okay. So generalized linear models 
uh, are the larger family of geocentric regression models that the linear regressions we've been using are members of. So the, the Gaussian outcome model is a special case of this bigger strategy where we have some probability distribution for an observable variable, an outcome variable, and we want to connect a linear model to the mean <laughs> of that distribution somehow. And I call this the generalized linear modeling strategy. It's this gambit. Uh, it's unreasonably effective given how geocentric it is. <laughs> it works amazingly well. It really has no business working as well as it does. The general strategy is we pick some outcome distribution. Uh, how? Uh, I'll talk about that. Uh, you won't be surprised to hear that maximum entropy is, <laughs> is the principle that I think is reasonable. Uh, then you model the parameters of that distribution using weird things called links. I'll explain what those are. Uh, and uh, those links, well, what do they do? Well, they link the distribution to some linear model. And then, of course, step three in Bayesian inference, you always know what step three is, right? Uh, compute the posterior distribution. Or step three should be question mark, question mark, question mark, and step four is compute the posterior distribution, right? But, um, so this is a very powerful approach. You can do uh, all kinds of fancy things. You can do multivariate relationships and nonlinear responses, lots of stuff with the same basic strategy. And I would say 99% of applied statistics is just generalized linear models. And then often, even if you don't want to play this game, um, and you have some scientifically derived model, when you write it down, it'll turn out to be a generalized linear model by accident. Uh, the, the, why? Because of maximum entropy. Right? Uh, real generative processes also generate maximum entropy distribution. So you end up with a GLM in an unreasonably large number of circumstances, even when you don't want one. Uh, it's a bizarre thing. I have some colleagues uh, when, who are also statisticians, and people come to them with stats problems. Um, and ask them what you know. They ask my colleagues what sort of model should I use. The colleague will say, "Well, I don't know enough details yet, but I bet it's a GLM, right? Just let's just start there. You probably want a GLM, and that's usually the case. So, how do we pick an outcome distribution? Uh, nearly all the outcome distributions we're going to use are exponential family distributions, and the reason is because this thing called the exponential family, they're all maximum entropy under some set of constraints. There are distributions which are not maximum entropy under any known constraints, and they're weird, and you might want to use those in some circumstance, but they don't tend to have much value in statistics. People don't tend to use them very much. And I think there's good reason, because uh, they don't have maximum entropy interpretations. Um, all of these exponential family processes arise from, uh, uh, distributions arise from natural processes. So with the Gaussian, remember, I wanted to teach you that the thing about on the football pitch, if you move left and right, the distributions of positions of players will eventually be Gaussian. Lots of processes aggregate up this way. The same is true for all the others. So the binomial, the exponential, uh, the, we'll do gamma distributions, uh, I think, beginning of next week. All of them can arise from natural processes that are well understood. And so we see them in nature all the time, and we shouldn't be surprised. Same true for power laws, which are also uh, members of these things. They have maximum entropy distributions. Uh, uh, constraints. Okay, uh, and I want to say, uh, this is my, my note at the bottom, should resist this thing that I see people doing all the time, which I call histomancy. Uh, so histomancy is, so you get some data set, you've got to figure out a probability distribution for the outcome, and so you plot it. Uh, and you look at the histogram, and then you kill a chicken, and then you figure out, sorry, you know, Greek sacrifice, right? And then you try to figure out uh, what distribution it is. You should never do this. This doesn't make sense under any framework. There is no statistical paradigm that makes this permissible um, at all. Uh, you want to use knowledge of your constraints in the first place to figure it out. But just in a pragmatic sense, there's no statistical framework in which the aggregate histogram of the outcomes, unconditional on something else, is going to have any particular distribution of all. Uh, you could have some variable which is perfectly Gaussian after you condition on the predictors, but there's no theorem which tells you that the whole population mixed together has to be Gaussian, right? Uh, so it's, it's, it doesn't make sense in any paradigm, but people do it all the time. In fact, I've seen it taught to people. Uh, so just don't do it. It's much easier to use principles instead of peering and guessing. So let me give you a quick introduction to some of these distributions um, so that you've got some vocabulary and you know their general shapes. And then what we're going to do starting today and through the next few weeks is we're going to build GLMs with these different outcome distributions. Uh, and you're going to see why they're useful and how they're connected to scientific processes. Um, 
And it's just an extension of what you've already been doing. And you've already got all the tools you need. So the first, the core member of the exponential family is, you guessed it, <laughs> the exponential. The exponential is everybody's favorite distribution because it's got exactly one parameter and it's got this really nice soothing shape. The exponential is the distribution that has the uh, same proportional rate of change across its whole shape. Uh, it's exponential. That's what exponential means. Uh, the, the lambda parameter is a rate, and the mean of this distribution is 1 over lambda. It's 1 over the rate. Generatively, the exponential can arise from a machine that has a number of parts, a machine like a body, say, <laughs> uh, has a bunch of parts, and if one of those parts breaks, the machine stops working. And uh, so you think about washing machines or dishwashers if you don't prefer to think about fruit flies. But <laughs> fruit flies are machines, right? And so if the fruit fly's heart stops or the dishwasher's heart stops, <laughs> what, what do dishwashers have? They don't have hearts. They have stuff like they have pumps. And that's it. <laughs> and uh, then the machine doesn't work anymore. You can't wash your dishes. Um, and uh, so if uh, there's a bunch of parts inside the washing machine and each of them has got some chance of breaking on any particular day, then the, the waiting time until the washing machine stops will be exponentially just, just distributed. This is a very interesting fact. Generatively, you see these things, uh, or approximately exponential distributions all the time as a result. Um, if you count events emerging from an exponential distribution, say now you got a bunch of fruit flies. Sorry, I don't mean to pick on fruit flies, but I was, you know, I did biology as an undergrad, so we had little, we had lots of flies and tubes, right? It's a thing. It's like a pastime. And uh, I also used to live in California, where fruit flies actually run the state. I think, <laughs> right? Sit at a glass of wine. Soon there will be a fruit fly. <laughs> and uh, so say we count, we, we're, we're counting fruit flies ascending to heaven and <laughs> uh, through some, in some fixed window of observation, there those mortality events, ascendance events arise uh, exponentially and we count them up. It turns out the distribution of mortality events uh, is binomial. It's like coin flips. Uh, you've got so many flies, each one could or could not ascend, and you count them up and you get a binomial distribution, which is the maximum entropy distribution for binary events with some constant expected value. There's no other distribution that is consistent with those constraints and distributes the probability more evenly. And the thing about this is it's a bit counterintuitive, there, and there's a section of chapter 10 where I also prove to you that the binomial is maximum entropy, because um, that's not very flat, right? But that's because there's a constraint that the expected value is high. So it's got to bunch up against the ceiling, right? Most of the flies die eventually. All flies go to heaven. It was a Disney movie, right? Uh, okay. Um, there's this other distribution that we're going to use, I uh, think starting on Friday. I'm going to spend all of Friday on this distribution. It's one of my favorites uh, called the Poisson distribution. Or if you're speaking English, you can just say Poisson. <laughs> really, <laughs> you don't have to do the accent, right? And uh, um, there are two ways to think about getting this. If you start with a binomial distribution, if, if you have some binomially distributed random variable, uh, but the probability of any particular success is very low and there are a huge number of trials. What would this mean? There's a lot of flies and the flies have really long lifespans. <laughs> then the mortal the, your count mortality events among flies, it'll have a Poisson distribution. Or Poisson, I should stop sounding pretentious. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, also, you can just count exponential events that have a low rate, and you'll also get a Poisson. So the, sorry, Poisson. The <laughs> Poisson distribution is just a special case. Um, but it's a count distribution related to the exponential. And again, it arises in nature all the time, uh, and we're going to do uh, good stuff with it. Um, also, uh, if you count... If you think about the time to the event in the exponential, how long did you wait before your dishwasher broke, <laughs> right? And you're recording, or times to death for fruit flies. Um, if you start adding those times together, so say like two things have to break before the dishwasher stops working, or you want to know the amount of time before a certain number of fruit flies have died, then those waiting times are distributed in another way, the gamma distribution. The gamma distribution is a distribution of waiting times or distances in which multiple things have to happen before the event of interest occurs. And then you get a gamma distribution. Gamma distribution is also a really common in natural phenomena. It's also maximum entropy. Um, 
a maximum entropy distribution. For example, age of onset of cancer is gamma distributed. Why? Well, no one knows for sure, but it's plausibly the case because there are lots of cellular defense mechanisms and all of them have to fail before the cancer can get going, right? It's like a bunch of locks uh, in the cell that are trying to stop it. And uh, so the gamma distribution is distribution of the waiting time until all those things fail. And so it's true that in humans at least, uh, age of onset of cancer is gamma distributed. Um, if you get a gamma distribution with a really large mean, it converges to a normal distribution. And now we're back home <laughs> and we've got normals again. Yeah, there are lots of other ways to get a normal. This isn't the only way, right? All roads lead to normal. And once you're normal, you're stuck in normal. It's like an absorbing state. There's no way out. Yeah. So what's the point of this? Uh, I don't expect you to memorize this. I just want to show you that the, there's consilience to all this. There are generative processes which link together all the distributions we use in stats. And each of them is principled based upon the constraints on the variable that we're counting. And then all the rest of the shape of the distribution comes from maximum entropy. It comes from betting on things that can happen lots of ways. Those are the things that are more likely to happen in proportion to the more ways that they can happen. And that's all it is. It doesn't mean that these things are correct, uh, but it's, it's the betting part of statistical inference that arises. Okay, I got half an hour left, so now let's do some actual statistics. <laughs> uh, we're going to build on this. And so I showed you this before, right? The tide prediction engine, or maybe a different one. This is Lord Kelvin's tide prediction engine. And I put it in here again, because uh, when we get to generalized linear models, this metaphor is very potent. Um, what is this metaphor about again? So this is a mechanical computer. And there's a certain part of it uh, that is the uh, uh, prediction of when the tides will come. And then there's all this stuff at the bottom, which is just calculating junk that allows the calculations to work. The bottom are your parameters in a model. And the top is the output, is the prediction space that you're interested in. And this was true with, even with Gaussian models. As soon as you had interaction effects, things got really hard. And we had to start doing those triptych things that I like, remember? Uh, lots of things to understand the model. With generalized linear models, you're absolutely wedded to this prediction perspective if you want to understand what's going on. Uh, it, it, these things are like tide prediction engines. The, the relationship between the bottom layer and the top layer is nonlinear now. It's got a bunch of intermediate things, which are hard to have intuitions about. But you can understand these models as long as you resist the urge to understand the parameters. I know that sounds bizarre, but you want to understand the prediction space. You understand the parameters by looking at their effects on prediction. So how do we build these things? Um, so I just went through the sermon on maximum entropy. You pick an outcome distribution. Uh, this turns out to be pretty easy in practice. You're not going to be solving a, some Lagrangian optimization problem, right? Like an economist would, Jeff, <laughs> right? But because that's how you find max distributions. You, you usually use Lagrangian. But um, you don't have to do that. You just need to think about before the data have arrived, you know things about the outcome variable just by its very nature. So for example, a count variable, which is what we're going to start with. Those are the most useful generalized linear models. Count variables are, are integers starting at zero. Guarantee it. So there are no negative counts, right? A difference can be negative, but a count can't. So from the very beginning, you know things about the variable before you've seen the values in the variable. And then that constrains the distributions to make sense for it. And so the count distributions that arise uh, are the Poisson, the binomial, and then the multinomial, which is just an extension of the binomial to, to more events, um, and geometric, which I'll talk about later. Geometric is like the exponential, but for discrete counts. Uh, we're going to work with count models this week. And then starting next week, I'm going to about, talk about models that I call monsters. Uh, they're monsters because you glue together different kinds of distributions with special link functions to do very useful things for kinds of data that arise naturally. Uh, the most common sort are things like ranks or ordered categories. Um, there are psychologists in the audience, yeah, if you want to reveal yourselves. Uh, uh, Likert scales, is that, is that how you say it? Likert scale? Yeah? Okay, someone's nodding yes. I've never known. And Likert was a person, right? Okay, so it's not a location or something like Likert, Pennsylvania. <laughs> but uh, so these things in psychology called Likert scales, which are these ordinal integer scales. And they're not metric, though, because it, typically you'll ask somebody, how happy are you today on a scale from 1 to 7? Something like that, right? And the, what it takes to get a person from 1 to 2 might be very different than what it takes to get them from 6 to 7. 
And so while they're ordinal, they're not metric. The distances between the different values are not constant. And so these things are really nasty to model, I think. Uh, usually people just wave their hands and use a Gaussian, right? But we're going to do better. I'm going to show you how to do much, much better than that. And, but we're going to build a monster to do it, right? It's how you fight monsters. You make monsters, right? <laughs> and uh, um, I'll also show you how to do the same thing on the prediction side. Sometimes you have predictor variables, which are ordered categories, and the same thing applies. The distances between the units is not constant. You don't want to treat them as metric. Uh, you can do the same thing on the, on, on the right-hand side of, of the equation. So I'll show you both, but this will be next week. Um, and then mixture distributions, uh, which will provide a transition for us into multi-level models, which are cases where we take, um, usually it's a count model distribution, like a binomial or a Poisson, and then we model one of its parameters as emerging from a distribution where there's heterogeneity. And these are called mixture models, and they're really useful. They're super useful. And they bear a lot of resemblance to multi-level models. Uh, so I'm going to show you some examples of these mixture distributions. And then the following immediately on the heels, we'll start really doing multi-level modeling. Because uh, it'll, pro it'll provide a nice conceptual introduction. Okay, step two in generalized linear models. There's this thing called a link. Uh, so consider the Gaussian linear regression pictured here. You're familiar with this now, right? You see it in your dreams. <laughs> your dreams are just full of dancing linear regressions. Yeah. And uh, linear regression is super benign, and that's the reason I started the course with it, uh, well, after the globe tossing model, because it has a very special property, which no other generalized linear model has. And that is that the scientific measurement units on the outcome variable and the mean, the parameter of it, the parameter for the mean, are the same. So for example, when we model, had the height model, um, height was measured in centimeters in that example. Uh, mu also has units of centimeters, right? Because it's the mean height. This is not true for any other generalized linear model, unfortunately. <laughs> but that's the case. So we didn't notice that there was any kind of uh, friction or problem to solve here. We didn't need this thing called a link. What is the link and what problem does it solve for us? The much more typical case is something like a binomial model, like the globe tossing model, which I'll build up here. If you want to connect a linear model to the parameter p, which is the probability of success on any given trial, uh, p is a probability. What are the units on a probability? Exactly. None, right? Uh, so they're shaking heads in the audience. They're none, right? Exactly. It's unitless. Uh, probabilities are unitless. All the units have divided out, right? You folks remember doing scientific notation and like balancing your units once upon a time? Yeah. And so the units uh, cancel out in a probability. Uh, but your outcome is a count, and it has units. Count of something, people, fruit flies, <laughs> right? Something like that. It has units on it. Uh, so now the units aren't the same, and we've got to have something that connects the parameters now to the outcome scale. And um, as a consequence of this, the, the domains that are legitimate on the parameter uh, are not on the parameters inside the linear model are not going to be the same as the outcome. <laughs> and so the usual thing here is we, we want to connect this linear model alpha plus beta x, typical linear model, to pi. Uh, but we can't just say that pi equals that because a linear model can be any real value, but a probability can't. It's bound between 0 and 1. So we need some function to put in there for where that question mark is to make it so that this thing uh, obeys the laws of physics. And um, this thing is called the link function. And what we're going to do is we're going to wrap the parameter p in some function. I'll say what it is when we get to that part of the lecture, uh, which constrains it to the right shape. And we say some function of the probability is linear. There's some transformation we could do to the probability so that it is linear in these other parameters. I know this is weird, but bear with me. It'll make total sense. It will. You'll love it. <laughs> okay, the third step, of course, is you compute the posterior. You know how to do this. Um, with generalized linear models, searching is harder. Uh, uh, ordinary least squares um, can be used, but actually it, it tends to be pretty fragile. There's this thing called generalized least squares, which is used a lot in non-Bayesian inference. We're just going to start using Markov chains uh, because we also want to have priors in here, and we want to get a really good approximation and not worry about it. Um, and that's why Markov chains were introduced last week. Uh, one of the fun things that happens with generalized linear models 
is that suddenly all of the variables interact with one another. Even if you don't explicitly put an interaction effect inside your linear model, just a bunch of additive terms, they will interact on the outcome scale. Why? Because that's how nature is. Right? This is not some bizarre statistical accident that is like this. It's a necessary consequence of modeling the natural phenomenon. So let me try to give you an example. Again, remember I was a biologist, so all my examples are things like lizards and <laughs> dandelions and stuff. But um, so imagine you, you're you're trying to understand the habitat preferences of some real animal, <laughs> right? Like a like a reptile. And uh, sorry, I'm a primatologist, so I have to make fun of myself all the time, right? But um, so. Uh, with reptiles, if it gets really cold, um, their probability of survival is very low, uh, and, and it can get really hot, and they can live uh, under really hot temperatures, right? So this is like Australia. Australia right now has been like 45 degrees centigrade for three weeks or something like that. Yeah, I don't know. All the humans are fleeing in rafts or something, and the lizards are low. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, the, what I want you to see is that on the probability scale on the vertical here. Uh, eventually things get cold enough that you're dead no matter what, right? You can't die twice. This is the basic fact about the physics of mortality. And so if any one variable is going to kill a lizard, then it doesn't matter what the values of the other variables are. That's an interaction effect. When the effect of a predictor variable depends upon the values of the other, and that necessarily arises from what I call ceiling and floor effects in probability outcomes. If it's sufficiently cold, I don't care how much food you give the lizard, it's going to die, right? It's an interaction effect where the effect of feeding uh, is conditional on the temperature. Yeah. Um, and that, again, that's not a statistical accident. It arises from the, you want your model to do this. You absolutely want it to do this. Um, there's a box in the book where I, I try to show you mathematically the consequence. If you like to think about these uh, linear regressions uh, this way, if you just think about the rate of change in the mean of a linear regression with respect to any old slope, that means you take the partial derivative of mu with respect to beta, it's a constant. It is the beta coefficient. That's why linear regressions are so nice. Do this with any generalized linear model. Oh yeah, the chain rule kicks in. You'll be taking that derivative for a couple minutes, and, or you can use your computer, and you get a much less nice uh, expression. Uh, so for example, this in a logistic regression, which is what we're going to do uh, today, starting today and through Friday, um, this is the equation for a logistic regression. P equals this thing. I'll explain this to you in a few minutes. Uh, and if you take the partial derivative of P with respect to X, you get this thing on the right. And you're like, what is that thing? Yeah, well, that's the necessary, that's the rate of change in probability as you change X. And the whole linear model is still there. You see it? It has not gone away. So that's why everything matters. That's this, that interaction arises as a consequence of the compression of the scale. Okay. So let's actually move into doing some good work here. Um, we're going to work with the binomial distribution and uh, model some counts of events. This is like the globe tossing thing from the beginning of the course. What is the binomial distribution for? It's counts of some specific event out of n possible trials. So n is the maximum value that it could take, and 0 is the minimum value it could take. And there's some constant expected value conditional on the predictor variables. Right. If you change the predictor variables, you get a different constant expected value. Uh, but for any specific set of predictor variables, the, uh, the binomial assumes that there's a constant expected value. And then under those conditions, the maximum entropy distribution is binomial. It's the distribution you get by counting the pass through the garden of forking data. So there's two parameters in a binomial, um, n, which is the number of trials, the number of coin flips, and p, which is the probability of success on any given trial. I know you're familiar with this already because we, we worked with it in the beginning of the course. Uh, the expected value of binomial is n times p, the number of trials times the probability of success in any given trial. And the variance is n p 1 minus p. The variance and the mean are not independent anymore like they were in the Gaussian. And in general, the Gaussian is the only distribution you will work with in your life where the mean and the variance are independent. Every other case. If the mean gets bigger, the variance gets bigger in most cases. It's not true for the binomial because if the mean gets really big, you bunch up against one, right? Uh, so the, the relationship here is actually when is the variance maximized in a binomial? When p is a half. Yeah. Those of you who work with you know, genetics and stuff, you're familiar with this, right? With diversity indices and things. Ecologists know this too. Yeah. Um, but the lesson I want you to get is that 
that case where mu and sigma are independent in a Gaussian. That's a really rare, rare circumstance. Uh, it doesn't happen with anything else. Okay. Um, so we're going to model, we're going to plug a linear model and attach it to P. How do we do this? We need a link function. Let me motivate this link function for you. So uh, on the horizontal on this graph, I've got some predictor variable X and we're going to attach some slope to it and um, it's going to be linear related on some scale that's called the log odds. What are log odds? Well, the odds are P over one minus P and the log odds is the log of that. <laughs> it's exactly what it is. Uh, and it turns out if you do this, there's a very nice, this is the conventional link, um, there's a very nice mapping onto the probability scale where X is linear on the log odd scale. And so our whole linear model is defined on the log odd scale. Uh, and it'll be constrained then to the zero one probability interval on the outcome scale. And in chapter 10, I show you that this is not some ad hoc assumption. This arises from the maximum entropy derivation of the binomial distribution, this relationship, uh, which is a really cool thing, I think. So in machine learning, they call this the maximum entropy classifier. They don't call it a bi uh, binomial regression, actually. This is different literatures, different derivation histories. So analytically, let me show you what this looks like. Uh, this is the binomial uh, uh, model, the way we're going to write them. Yi is distributed binomially, number of trials n, probability on, each, uh, on trial i of p. Uh, then we write this link function logit. Logit means log odds. Uh, the log odds of pi is equal to some linear thing, alpha plus beta x. So p right, is the probability scale over there on the right-hand graph. And then this linear model thing, that's the log odd scale on the left-hand graph. And they're connected through this logit function. And what is the logit function? It's log odds. So let me show it to you what it looks like. Um, it really is just log odds. Remember I said odds is P over one minus P? Those are the odds, right? Anybody here uh, do betting and gambling? You shouldn't, shame on you. But if you do, you know all about odds, right? <laughs> <laughs> odds are really handy to think in. Uh, if you measure stuff in odds, you can you can use Bayes' formula intuitively really fast because you can do these multiplications and do the odds adjustments. It's like I'm teaching you how to gamble. Don't listen to me. <laughs> but uh, um, so and the log odds are just the log of the odds. That's all it is. So this is, that's what the logit function is. And we're saying that's linear. So how do you get back to the probability scale? You just use algebra and you solve for p, and then you get this thing which uh, we're going to call it the inverse logit, uh, but it's also the logistic function. If you're an ecologist, you know this is a logistic growth function, right? It shows up in all kinds of cases. Uh, so this is the conventional way uh, link in a binomial uh, GLM uh, because it has maximum entropy properties. It has lots of good mathematical properties. Uh, for users like yourselves, you want some intuition about how it works. Um, because this log odds scale is a there's there's a metric scale there, and at, and you want to relate it to the probability scale. So this is a graph to help you understand this. So on the horizontal axis we've got the outcome scale of probability. Zero on the left, the event never happens. One on the right, the event always happens. 0.5 in the middle happens, uh, equal time, uh, yes and no. On the vertical scale we've got this alien log odds thing, right? Um, on the log odds scale, zero is one half on the probability scale. So that's your anchor point. Think about log odds of zero is equal chance on the outcome scale. But then it, log odds get smaller and the probability goes down towards zero and it gets bigger and it goes up towards one. On the log odds scale, you can go to minus infinity and you can go up to positive infinity, but the probabilities will stop at zero and one. Uh, there's this compression effect uh, between the two. So I want you to understand that you need some anchor values to think about it. Um, a log odds of one is about three fourths of the time, and minus one is about one fourth of the time. Yeah, about close enough for government work, right? <laughs> uh, uh, a log odds of three is ninety-five percent of the time, or minus three is five percent of the time. Log odds of four is always. <laughs> log odds of minus four is never. Log odds of five is really always. <laughs> log odds of minus five is really seriously, I, I'm serious this time, absolutely never gonna happen. Uh, so this turns out to be really important for defining priors. Uh, 
uh, and we'll get to that in a second, that when you put a prior on the log odd scale, you need to interpret it on the outcome scale, and that's tricky. Uh, but we, you already know how to do it because I taught you how to do prior predictive simulations, right? So we're going to do that for this and, and avoid all the disasters that could arise. Okay, this is just a summary slide uh, for my logit link lesson. Um, uh, we use this thing because it's the natural link inside the probability formula. Uh, it's the log odds are in a sense the fundamental parameter of the binomial distribution. And again, there's this oh, there's this box on page uh, 313 to 314 where I show you this. It, without any assumption, this weird link function arises naturally in the derivation of the binomial distribution. Um, there are other cases though where you want a different link, and those are equally justified by the natural processes you're modeling. And the common ones would be probe it. This is very common in economics because you know, economists always want to do things different. I think they're cool kids, right, Jeff? And, <laughs> and, uh, and the complementary log log. Uh, uh, there are uh, big and legitimate statistical literatures which use these links. I'm not going to use them in lecture here, but that's not because I think badly of them. I just wanted to let you know. Um, if you've got a scientific model, you can nearly always derive the link automatically. And I'll have an example of that when we get to the Poisson. Uh, models. And I'll show you a sci an actual scientific model where the link function emerges just from the basic science. Okay, I got 10 minutes though and I want to talk about chimpanzees. So, I always want to talk about chimpanzees, right? <laughs> but especially now. So, let's get an example data set to motivate this. You're only going to learn these things through action, right? Really processing some data. So, uh, in the rethinking package, there's a data set that comes from a published experiment looking at the prosocial tendencies um, of our close relatives, the chimpanzees. Here's the setup of the experiment. So uh, what you're looking at on the left is my bad drawing of the experimental apparatus. Uh, and on the right, you've got photos of actually what it was. And with these, I think I can explain it to you. So what you, I want you to see on the left is to imagine that you're a chimpanzee sitting on the close end of the table, looking out at the table. And there are these two levers in front of you, one on the left and one on the right. And if you reach out and grab one of those levers and pull it towards you, it will make the weird accordions in the middle of the table expand out. And there are two trays attached to that accordion. And there may or may not be food in those trays. So there are two options on one side of the table. Uh, on the left, in this case, there's only food on your side and the dish on the other side is empty. If you pull this one, food comes to you and an empty dish goes to the other side of the table where an, a conspecific may be sitting. Yeah, That conspecific has no levers. They are helpless. They are at your mercy. Yeah. And if you pull the other side, there's a so-called prosocial option where there's food on both ends. And if you pull that one, both of you get a snack. Right? These may be grapes. Chimpanzees will do anything for a grape. Yeah, maybe not anything, but a lot. They really like grapes. <laughs> and uh, so uh, what we're interested in is the pros whether chimps care about this distinction. Um, what's tricky about doing an experiment like this, of course, is that it's not enough just to do the experiment as this table is set up because they may just be attracted to more food and pull the right-hand side in this case because there's more food on that side. Even though they only get one of the items, they might pull the right-hand side because, well, there's more food there. Yeah. If you hung out with a chimpanzee, you, you realize the risk of this, right? Or a child, a human child. It's very similar. <laughs> They'll always point to the bigger pile. And uh, so there's a, an, one of the experimental treatments is to remove the partner from the other end. It's not just that we're interested in whether or not they, they pull the right-hand lever in this case, or rather they pull the lever that's associated with the prosocial option, because that'll be counterbalanced, right, left and right, because chimpanzees are handed like people are. Most of them are right-handed, and so you have to adjust for handedness. Uh, but you also you want to know the difference, the interaction effect. You want to know whether they pull the prosocial option more when there's another individual at the other end. Does that make sense? I think it's a clever experiment. It's it's just cool. So uh, and chimps got a lot of grapes, so it's always good. So to summarize that. Two conditions, there's the partner and the alone condition. With the partner condition, the other individual's on the end. In the alone condition, the other end the table is empty. Uh, two options, the prosocial and asocial option, which are counterbalanced left and right across trials. Each uh, focal chimpanzee does a bunch of different trials on different days. And uh, then there are two outcomes you can observe. They pull the left lever or the right lever. We want to predict this outcome um, as a function of the condition. That is the, the total treatment that the individual found themselves in on that trial. 
uh, so that we can figure out whether chimps prefer the left lever when the partner is present and prosocials on the left. This is an interaction effect. So I get to teach you binomial regression and interactions again, all at once. Yeah. Here's how we're going to code it. Um, let's take all the possible uh, coding treatments and make it into an index variable. So there are four possible distinct unordered treatments. We're going to number them one to four. Number one is the prosocial options on the right, and there's no partner at the other end of the table. Number two, prosocial options on the left, and there's no partner. Three, it's on the right, and there's a partner. Four, it's on the left, and there's a partner. These are all the four different possible treatment combinations. And we want to estimate the tendency to pull the left lever in each of these and use that to figure out if there's an interaction effect, right? Um, so the linear model in the left, the only uh, novel part of this model is the binomial part in this logit thing. The rest is, you know, ye olde linear model, right? I've got um, a vector of alpha parameters, one for each actor. You're going to see this is super important. There's repeat measures on actors, and actors have handedness preferences. So alpha is measuring handedness. Right? It's, it's like an adjusting for the back door through handedness <laughs> is what you're doing in this case. Uh, and then we have a vector of four um, beta parameters, one for each treatment. And I leave the priors to be determined because there's several slides about that uh, coming up. Does this make sense? Yeah. Oh, I, I wanted to say here, I'm going to write binomial 1P in this course, but sometimes you'll see that written as uh, Bernoulli P. The Bernoulli distribution is just a binomial with one trial. It's like the binomial named after a Swiss mathematician. I think that's... Bernoulli was Swiss. Does someone know? I think he was Swiss. Um, okay. How do we do priors? Uh, priors and GLMs uh, behave in very counterintuitive ways. And so I think the only responsible thing to do is do prior predictive simulation to see what the implications are of the priors on the outcome scale uh, before you, you fit the model to the data. So uh, let's consider the, the basic problem, of a skeletal version of the binomial regression where the linear model is just some alpha parameter, some intercept. And this will be the average log odds of the outcome. That's all alpha is going to mean. It's just the average log odds across all trials. Uh, what kind of prior do we want to set on that? Uh, so let's say we put a, a Gaussian prior on this thing. Um, that makes sense. Alpha is on the real number line, so we can assign a Gaussian to it. But we have to, and zero makes sense if you want, because zero means a half. So if you want to locate it, the prior on a half, so that it's neither more common or less common than chance, that makes sense. But what about the scale? And I put this omega in here to say we, that's our choice. We have to pick an omega. What happens when you pick omega? So let's say we pick something seemingly benign like 10. That'd be weakly regularizing in a kind of linear regression, depending upon the scale that you use. Uh, let's do prior predictive simulation with this. And we get all the code to do this is in the book. Um, you know how to do prior predictive simulations, though. And what happens is uh, what I show you here. On the bottom axis of this plot, we have um, the probability scale, that is the outcome scale of the event. This is the prior probability the chimpanzee pulls the left lever uh, from that model. Uh, the black density curve is the prior where you, you assign alpha a normal 0, 10. This looks really strange. Uh, why is it like this? Because a Gaussian distribution with a standard deviation of 10 has huge amounts of mass outside of log odds 3 or minus 3. Uh, it's piling up almost all the prior probability says either it never happens or it always happens. Even though, you're loving this, I can tell Rihanna's loving this. <laughs> Even though zero is the point with highest probability in the Gaussian, but most of the mass is out in the tails, outside the extreme log odds intervals. Because remember, four means always, minus four means never, <laughs> right? And a Gaussian with a standard deviation of 10 Think about it. that's the standard deviation. So 95% of the mass then is between 20 and minus 20. Yeah, so almost all of it is that. So what happens when you transform it to the probability scale is you get these spikes at 0 and 1. This prior thinks either it always happens or it never happens. And that's not what you want to assume, I think. <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> probably not what you want to assume. This is a very bad default. Uh, it can get worse, so uh, lots of people run Bayesian binomial regression models where they'll put a uh, standard deviation of 100 in there. And this just makes it really absurd. This prior is not harmless. Uh, this can do a lot of harm, actually. 
Um, so you want to use something that's actually sensible. Uh, I'm going to adopt this convention. It's just about as flat as you can possibly get. I think we probably would want to regularize a little more than this, but I'm going to adopt this heuristic position of just having something flat on the probability scale, and that would be normal with a standard deviation of 1.5. And then it's basically flat on the probability scale. Yeah, but it's definitely not flat on the log odd scale. It's pretty concentrated around the middle. Prior predictive simulation lets you suss this out. You can figure these things out. Does this make some sense? Are you terrified? Don't be terrified. You just have to simulate. Yeah, there are tools to get you out of the terror. Okay, it's 11 o'clock, so I should stop. Um, when we return on Friday, I will continue this, and we will talk about uh, how we get priors on the slopes as well through the same sort of prior predictive simulation. And then we'll actually model chimpanzees pulling levers, and that part will be rapid. But we've got to do all of this scaffolding first, right? All right, thank you for your time, and I'll see you on Friday.